Ladies and gentlemen, on May the 17th of 2016, Jerry Ridge went to work at his business, Valley Pawn Brothers. Mr. Ridge had that business, and he also had the business of the mail route or hauling the mail to Chattanooga and back. But on that particular day, he was at his business, the Pawn Brokers, and Jerry was 72 years old on May the 17th. Some things happened in the afternoon of May 17th. The calls came in, the first call to 911 came in at 4.50 p.m. in the afternoon. The call came in that there was a fire at Valley Pawn Shop. As luck would have it, the Volunteer Fire Department in Whitwell, they were at, at the uh, fire hall when the call came in. They were dispatched, and they were there at 4.54 p.m. By 5.35 p.m. that afternoon, they had found the body of Jerry Ridge, who was deceased, and they notified the Sheriff's Department about the fatality. Chief Brown will tell you that once they, they found the body of Mr. Ridge, they withdrew from the scene once they suppressed the fire and turned the scene over to law enforcement to work uh, the fatality. And of course, at this point, nobody knew exactly what it was they had. The cause and origin of the fire is something that the state will have to show you. And this is the exterior of the business that it looked like once the fire department had left, and that's the front of the pawn shop looking in, and that's the scene that the officers were working on. The cause and origin of the fire, you're going to hear from Darby Hutchinson. And one of the things that was recovered at the scene is a can of Zippo lighter fluid. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But when the defendant was taken into custody two days later, a similar can of Zippo lighter fluid was found. Dr. Deering performed the autopsy on the body of Jerry Ridge. And what Dr. Deering will tell you is a couple of things. He'll say, first of all, that he was shot in his right arm. Mr. Ridge was also stabbed, but the they recovered a 25 caliber bullet. Now law enforcement was not able to match this bullet to any weapon that we recovered during the course of this investigation. But you'll hear from Laura Hodge that that's what was recovered. It was a 25 caliber shell. He was also uh, stabbed in the neck. The wound was to the left internal jugular vein. Dr. Deering will tell you that was the primary cause of death. However, as General Shelton mentioned, he has described the gunshot wound as a nasty wound. The thermal injuries, the body of Mr. Ridge was burned very badly, and Dr. Deering will tell you that the thermal injuries occurred after Mr. Ridge was deceased. And the reason he says that is the lack of soot in the trachea and also the carbon monoxide levels in the blood were, were normal. But the wounds, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> The bullet wound is here, roughly, and you'll notice an object, and that's actually the 25 caliber bullet. There's also a bullet here, however, it's showing up on the x-ray, but that bullet was actually just in the body bag. It has nothing to do with the, uh, with the death of Mr. Ridge, it just it shows up on the x-ray because it was in the uh, body bag. Also, on May the 17th, Dale Watts, you're going to hear from her. She came to the, um, she came by the pawn shop, and she'll tell you that she got there sometime after 3 o'clock, and she went by to pay uh, something her nephew or grandson or one of her family members owed, owed Mr. Ridge. So she goes by the pawn shop, and the defendant is there. And, and Ms. Watts will tell you that she knew the defendant. She knew Angela Kilgore, I'd known her from the community, and that she had a conversation with Ms. Kilgore. In fact, at one point, she and her grandson went out to Ms. Kilgore's truck because Ms. Kilgore had a dog, and they were looking at the dog and just talking in general. But there was an unusual thing that Ms. Kilgore was wearing that day. Ms. Kilgore had on purple nitrile gloves, what I think of white test gloves, but apparently there's nitrile gloves, which are kind of like EMTs would wear, your doctor would wear, Detectives may wear and work in a crime scene. And she had on these gloves, which Ms. Watts thought was unusual. Uh, most people 
don't wear nitro gloves, just out wandering around. Well, she asked Ms. Kilgore. Ms. Kilgore said, well, I've had poison oak and the doctor told me to wear these because he's put medicine which Ms. Watts would tell you she thought was odd because she's a nurse and that was not her understanding of how one would treat poison oak. The gloves, ladies and gentlemen, were subsequently recovered at the crime scene. And that is the glove there, ladies and gentlemen. The purple nitro glove was recovered at the crime scene. And you'll hear about this in a few minutes as far as what that glove told the investigators about this particular crime. And this would have been recovered that evening sometime as they worked the scene. But that's inside the pawn shop. When the officers came into the pawn shop and began working, there was a lot of blood, um, which is one of the reasons they ultimately called the violent crime response team to come out and work the scene. But this particular, this is a receipt book and what the officers saw in the receipt book was a receipt written to Angela, Angela Kilgore that, that day on May the 17th. It was received for $4,000 for saddles and some other things. And when she was arrested two days later, taken into custody, and I'll show you this, this is a zoomed in, and that's, it's kind of hard in this picture, but you can make out the name Angela Kilgore. And therefore, when they saw that, obviously the officers wanted to speak to her and find out what, you know, what, what she knew about this particular incident. When she was taken into custody two days later, what she had, you notice the initials JR, it's $4,000, four saddles, a bandsaw, pressure washer, promissory note, and some other items. That was the receipt that was in her possession when she was taken into custody on May the 19th. The officer searched, served a search warrant at her residence on May the 18th, and inside the residence they found the saddles, and they also found some saws and the pressure washer were found inside her residence on May the 18th. The defendant, having seen the receipt in there, the officers began looking for Angela Kilgore. They also received information that a red truck had been parked in front of the pawn shop during the time these events occurred. Officers did some checking. Ms. Kilgore owned a red truck, so therefore she became, as they like to say in the media, a person of interest. And she was interviewed by law enforcement that night. They talked to her. She came down to Whitwell PD voluntarily. And I'll direct your attention to the boots that she's wearing. She's wearing brown boots. And you'll see a better picture later but the boots are important, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a minute. They also photographed her hands. And Ms. Kilgore had cuts on this hand, as well as there is a laceration on her other hand that you can see there. And one of the witnesses will tell you, I believe Darren Rogers from the raceway, that when she came in there after these events that occurred, that she was bandaged and had been bleeding. She was not taken into custody at that time. Officers also took some photographs of the defendant's truck. And it's the front and the back of the truck. And what you see and what the arrows are pointing to is she has a Confederate license plate on the front and she has some decals on the back of the truck. She was taken into custody two days later at Foster Falls. The officers located her and they took her into custody at that point. And this is her truck at Foster Falls two days later, and you'll notice where the arrows are, the decals or whatever they were in the back window are gone, and also the Confederate flag license plate is no longer on the truck. So she has changed since the crime occurred the appearance of her truck somewhat. The officers in working the truck found some items. And the truck ultimately went to the crime lab, and we'll talk about that. But the first thing I want to talk about is this bag. And that bag, as you can see, has firearms on top of it. They're handguns. And the officers later laid those out on a table. And I believe there's 15 or 16 guns um, that were recovered from, that, from the truck. Now, 
Three of those guns went to the crime lab because they had what the officers referred to as RBS, which is a red blood stain. They don't know if it's blood, that's why they sent it to the crime lab, but it appeared to have blood, so they sent those. Three of the guns went to the crime lab for analysis. Mr. Ridge was a federal firearms, had a federal firearms license, and they obtained the federal firearms record book uh, from the pawn shop, and, and these are lists of the various guns that Mr. Ridge had that he has to maintain for his federal firearms license. Each gun that's contained in the photograph that you just saw that was obtained from her truck in that bag came, is reflected in the federal firearms license book. <clears throat> All 15 or 16 guns are shown in this book at various various places. They're not all together, but they're spread out, and, and Detective Johnson went through it and matched the serial numbers to the guns at the pawn shop. There are some other items in the truck that officers recovered, and these were not recovered actually until the, uh, they went to the crime lab. And you'll notice there's a shirt here, and that shirt becomes important in a minute. Um, Lisa Burgey, who's the DNA scientist, worked the truck and she actually obtained these items. And what she did is she laid out on the table the items taken from the front seat of the Ranger pickup. And this particular shirt is, will be of interest, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But also in the truck, you remember the Zippo lighter fluid can that was found at the crime scene, Valley Pond? Well, in her truck, when the officer searched it, there's another can of Zippo lighter fluid. So on May the 19th, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant was taken into custody, brought here to the Justice Center. And what she had in her possession on May the 19th, she had the receipt from Valley Pond that you saw a few minutes ago. She had a folding knife in her pocket. The folding knife was analyzed by the lab, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the folding knife had the victim's had the victim's DNA on it. And also, she had the brown boots. And we'll talk about what the lab did with these things. There was also some United States currency that she had. She had a hundred and some odd dollars, a hundred dollar bill, and some smaller bills. Some of those bills, which appeared to have blood stains on them, also went to the crime lab. And Lisa Burgey, the forensic scientist, will tell you about those. But let's start the TBI lab analysis with the boots. When they test for blood, blood and DNA and that sort of thing, and what, what Agent Burgey will tell you, she's the forensic scientist um, who tested these items. And, and let, me, let me preface that by saying there was some discussion in jury selection about qualifications of folks to do stuff. For Agent Burgey to testify, we will have to qualify her as an expert witness. And you will hear her credentials and why she's able to come in here and talk to you about DNA. I could not do that, but Lisa Burgey can because she's got that expertise and background. When they find their initial test is for the presence of blood. And to say that it's human blood, they have to do additional testing for the presence of human hemoglobin. Well, sometimes the sample is not big enough that if they do the further test to see if it's human blood, they'll destroy the sample, which means they couldn't test for DNA. So she found, she found what appeared to be human blood or the presence of, presence of blood on the boots, and the DNA profile on those boots matched Jerry Ridge. And you'll see other pictures of those boots when she testifies. She also tested the glove, and that's the glove that's the glove there that what you saw in Exhibit 15. That's the, the bloody glove. And there in the glove, she found the presence of hemoglobin, which is a comp component of human blood. And therefore, she'll be able to tell you that it's human blood on the glove. And she found two places where the glove, the, the hemoglobin of the blood matched the victim, Jerry Ridge. She also, and, and one thing with DNA, we, we think of it as either a sample having this DNA or that DNA, but you've got a mixture of fluids and skin cells, etc. 
So she didn't necessarily find Angela Kilgore blood, but what she did do is she swabbed areas that did not have a stain, and those swabs were consistent with the defendant, Angela Kilgore. This is a Zippo lighter fluid can, which also went to the crime lab. And she tested that. Um, there were stains and not all, um, not all were able to develop DNA. However, she did find, she did several reports. They went back and reanalyzed the presumptive tests and the first analysis indicated the presence of blood. She did a subsequent test on the June 30th report and she found the presence of human hemoglobin and the blood on the top and the back is Mr. Ridge and Ms. Kilgore was a major contributor as well to the blood found on the knife. And then there was a stain from a mixture which included Kilgore. She also tested the knife. In the knife, ladies and gentlemen, this is the knife that was in her pocket when she was taken into custody on May the 19th. And Agent Burgey tested the knife. And what she found on the knife was the presence of blood. There was a stain on the handle, which she will tell you the DNA matches two individuals. A major contributor was Mr. Ridge. There was a stain on blade two, which blade two is up here. There was a mixture of two individuals. A major contributor was Mr. Ridge. There was a stain on the blade, one and near the hinge, and that's going to be in this area. And that's DNA matched Jerry Ridge. And that is the knife that was in her pocket two days later when she was taken into custody. She also tested the shirt that was recovered from the front seat of the car. And the shirt had presence of blood, but she was able to develop DNA in, in, in several places. She found DNA under the left front pocket, presence of blood. That was a mixture of Mr. Kilgore, Ms. Kilgore and Mr. Ridge. On the left cut on the top of the sleeve, be up in here, she found Kilgore DNA, and on the inside of the cuff, DNA matched Mr. Ridge. She also tested the United States currency, and on the currency, what she found was the presence of blood. She could not do further testing on it. However, the $100 bill from the 1024 report, the DNA came from Ms. Kilgore, also, there were two $1 bills, and that DNA came from Kilgore, and that's where she found, she found the presence of blood. And lastly, in terms of stuff, the truck. The truck was ultimately taken to the TBI crime lab for analysis. When they took the truck, they seized the truck on May the 19th, when they took her into custody, it was brought to an indoor facility here at the Sheriff's Department or in the county, maintained there, and then it was taken to the TBI crime lab so the forensic scientists could go through it for any type of forensic evidence, trace evidence, blood, etc. And she found in her initial presumptive test the, in, the presence of blood. She was not able to determine it was human blood. However, the DNA on the driver's seat belt buckle, the interior of the passenger door matched Ms. Kilgore, and the stain near the rear passenger door was Mr. Ridge. Ladies and gentlemen, as General Shelton pointed out during questioning you all yesterday, Jerry Ridge can't be here to testify, obviously. But Jerry Ridge communicates to you all today through the DNA that was found. His DNA on the knife, which tested positive for blood, is present the knife which came out of her pocket. His DNA is on her boots that she was wearing on May the 17th and wearing still on May the 19th when she was taken into custody. His DNA on the shirt which tested positive presumptive tests for blood was on her shirt which was in the front seat of her truck. 
Mr. Ridge's DNA from the presumptive test of blood was also found inside her truck. In the glove, ladies and gentlemen, the purple nitrile glove that Ms. Watts saw her wearing that day. The defendant's DNA is on that and Mr. Ridge, the bloody glove. And the Zippo lighter fluid can and lastly, ladies and gentlemen, the guns that were taken out of that truck all trace back to his business because all those serial numbers are in his federal firearms license book. Those guns came from that business, is what the state will show you. Ladies and gentlemen, the conclusion of this proof, the state will ask you to convict, to convict this defendant of the charges and hold her accountable for the death of Jerry Ridge. Thank you.